Hey everybody, so welcome to the main heat where today we are going to have the two heavy contenders of the property graph versus triple store debate. Now I am making light of this and it's kind of a, an, an ode to an old school video that I have up here where I talk about something similar, but today we have two very special guests that are coming on to talk about which is better, RDF or triple stores, and how in many cases they can live in cohesion and harmony and loveliness, but sometimes not. All right, and so we're gonna get into it, but again, shout out in the comments below, which one are you using? Do you use these in combination? I'm also gonna have some resources down below in case you are interested in finding out more about these two topics. All right, so with that, let's go get started. My name is Dean Alamang. Um, I've uh, been doing AI for a long time. I did a PhD in AI back in 19, <clears throat> about many decades ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I'm probably best known for uh, semantic web for the working ontologist. I really got into semantic web stuff uh, early in this century. And one of the things that's happened in the past year is this whole new AI, which is very different from the AI that I was studying 40 years ago. Yeah, I'll tell you how long ago it was. Um, and uh, very, very different, but in some sense, very much the same in lots of ways. It's kind of interesting how that everything that goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things that um, I've found and will be, be one of the topics of today's session is uh, how much the semantic web can help us uh, manage the knowledge with a LLM, a modern AI. And so that's some stuff that I'm really excited about. And I'm working with data.world nowadays as a principal solution architect and uh, doing a lot of uh, both research and development on systems that can combine the powers of the semantic web and modern AI. So yeah, I'm, I'm Jesus Barraza and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm currently with Neo4j. I'm the head of solutions architecture here in EMEA. And um, been doing graphs for the probably best part of my career. I started as well, you know, in the semantic technology space where I did my PhD as well. So knowledge representation and reasoning, trying to map relational schemas to ontologies. Uh, I was many years part of the, you know, the RDF community, if we kind of put it like that. Uh, and uh, and I, because of my background, I mean, since I've joined e 4 I've been doing, I mean, been, I think I've been kind of the bridge between the two communities in a way mm -hmm. that that's, you know, we mostly work with customers and, and, and there's plenty of conversations where they're interested in combining the two approaches. This is property graphs, RDF graphs. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that gets me into conversations like the one that we're having today. So I'm very much in touch with the whole community. I, I think we've, I mean, the first time we crossed each other, Dean was probably what, 20 years ago <laughs> in, in a oh. conference. I, I'm not sure. Why are we here? What? So you both... We're talking, a lot of this, I think, came out for me, at least, at the Knowledge Graph Conference, uh, where you both were talking to me about some of these these things. And then afterwards, we had some of these follow-ups, and, and you had a really intriguing idea to have a discussion. And no, we're not all going to agree with each other, right? That's that's actually a, a good, healthy way of doing discussion. But why, why now? Why this? Like, can you give me some background on why we're here? Probably I should start. Because um, about a little over a year ago, remember this was actually a fallout from the previous year's Knowledge Graph Conference. At, at the previous year's Knowledge Graph Conference, a demo that we saw a lot of folks do do this. Uh, Sean from Cambridge did this. Mike from um, Stardog did one. I think even Top Quadrant did. A whole bunch of people were doing a very similar demo whereby they would describe data in one way or another to an LLM ask the LLM to write a query using that description, you know, using whatever their stack was, and then get the answer out. Uh, this is what Juan decided to call, and I guess this is called on, chat with your data. So mm -hmm. you ask a question in natural language, you get an answer back, and what it's really doing is going through the data. This is actually very different from what a lot of people were doing with LLMs early on, and I think even still to this day, this has kind of become its, its own niche. And we were discussing this about a month later, which be almost exactly a year ago now, um, <laughs> a little bit more, with a big, I won't name them, but a big relational database service provider that has huge numbers of relational mm -hmm. databases mm -hmm. that they provide as services out to the world. And they had, of course, tried this as well. And then they found that things broke down a little bit too soon. You just couldn't quite figure out how to get something useful out of this. And they conjectured, as had we, as had everyone at the Knowledge Draft Conference, that if you were to have something more than just a DDL of your relational database, 
And that's something more, of course, from my world, that's something more is an ontology, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously Cambridge and Stardog were thinking the same way, that if you had something more, that you would be able to do better. And the, the fellow from this company said, yep, somebody, you know, you guys ought to build a benchmark where you actually can do a bake off and say, try this, try this. Mm -hmm. And of course, immediately, especially the scientist in Juan came in and said, yeah, it's it. but we don't know that we've got the best way we think we do, mm -hmm. but you have to show it. And a lot of different folks in the good old fashioned database community said, you know, the normal for normal forms that aren't just the five you hear of there are actually database description structures we talked about <laughs> since the 90s that address exactly this issue and so that's where we said you know what we should put together this benchmark but not just show semantic web versus plain old relational stuff we need to set this up so that anybody can come in with their yeah. theory test yeah. it out and juan said you know we'll know that we've really arrived if somebody from neo picks this up <laughs> I think that's probably a good segue after his. Yeah. yeah, no, and that's and 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 the truth is that you know the 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 benchmark had a great impact. I mean, it was very well received, and 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 you know the numbers were pretty impressive, right? I mm -hmm. can't remember what the initial uh, results were, but it, there was a substantial increase in the quality of the of the results of, of the query. Three but, to and, one on and, average, yeah. Exactly, and 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 the key word there was, you know, what's the impact of knowledge graphs in mm. in, in improving the quality? And of course, you know, we and, and we can get into that conversation as well. You know, we see knowledge graphs being built on Neo4j as well, and and uh, and some of our community said, well, I want to apply this. You know, we want I want to see these results in in uh, and 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 I, I said, well, it's probably worth uh, analyzing this in detail because while there's a number of elements in common, it's fundamentally different. I mean, mm -hmm. as you described, uh, Dean. In your case, data lives in a relational database, and, mm -hmm. and Neo4j is a graph database. So, you know, it, it, we're, we're not comparing, you know, apples to apples. And I happen to be running this monthly uh, webcast that we call Going Meta, and I said, mm -hmm. why don't I use one of the sessions to to you know unpick the the the, mm -hmm. the, the experiment that they I mean, the benchmark and do a bit of an experiment. I mean, I didn't completely replicate the benchmark, but pick pick a particularly interesting example and and analyze. What would that look like in in Neo for J? And 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 that's where the process started. So uh, and and that uh, that was something that that Dean uh, watched and 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 had some comments on. And and uh, so he he posted about it. And 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 that's when we met in 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 New York, right? So I said, hey, Dean. Mm -hmm. I haven't had time to to respond with the, with the blog post, but we should take this to you know make the conversation. Let's yeah. find you know a, a forum where we can have this. So that that's kind of the the sequence of, of events. Because uh, and, and that's where I think we can spend a bit more time. Because that that's where things become substantially different. So yeah. we have an elements in common, but 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 also differences. And, and so and in and I'm so happy that you had that conversation because here we are now, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's going to be a benefit for a lot of folks that. Um, I can attest that um, the research that's come out on this topic from from the both of you has, you probably don't, I mean, maybe you do, because you, you talk to a lot of, um, because we, we have all these conversations with other people that are in the graph semantic and just, you know, database community. But um, a lot of things that are happening behind closed doors at some very large places are looking at this exact stuff. So I can say that and and know that from my my connections into some spaces that you probably don't know about. So what that tells me is you're all hearing it. I am hearing it. So I think this is a really good thing that we can go in and and pick apart because you don't all agree on everything, which is which is actually a good thing. And I will say Dean, I think that going the approach where you actively said you want people to be able to reproduce and kick the tires and mush and gush and do whatever they need to do with this is why it's going so so big right now um because people like neo4j can pick it up others can pick it up and see how it works for them um and that makes it less um less focused on what you think the world should be and more about inviting those arguments and that additional yeah. like scrutiny because you feel very confident in what you did right so yeah. i think that's that's a key here my my, my intention was uh 
I mean, I try to use these these sessions to be didactic, to be you know, to invite people to you know to reflect, and and always, always, uh, um, we've actually I think I've shared it with you, Ashley. So mm -hmm. we we always share that you know all the assets that we use, all the mm -hmm. code that we generate. So mm -hmm. this idea of of uh, making it available is also built into into our initiative. So I totally agree on that. Yeah, and I I can even attest to that because I think I did something with Neo Forge. Oh, geez, it was a Halloween episode I did. And I did it with someone, one of your colleagues that uh, moved on, but yeah. um, she she just created all this code and just stuck it up on GitHub. She's like, "Here's how you do it." I'm like, "This is great. <laughs> Give it out to people." Because honestly, and and I think you both have said this, it's the graph community. It's kind of like we we all have differences of opinions, which we're, we're going to talk about today. But I think we all understand that um, it's it's an area that people just need to get more involved in, no matter which direction they come in from, no matter which tool they're using, getting more folks um, in into a better understanding of how graph can play a part, I think is, is really important. And you know, LLMs are doing us a huge favor right now because it's like, oh yeah, trusting your data and knowing what it actually is. Hmm, might be a good idea. <laughs> Gee, right? maybe we should do a thing like maybe catalog it, or maybe there should be stewardship or governance. Wow, whoever thought that maybe that you should know where your data. data came from. Wow, uh, oh, lineage and and provenance. Oh my gosh, where did you get these crazy ideas, Ashley? No, I know we're all we're all <laughs> we're all poking fun, but really, I mean, it's very common, you know, for for a lot of things you know the data is what it is and you kind of put some duct tape on it and and at the end of the day as long as it does the thing you need it to do it's fine um, but now with llms it's like no it's got to have a lot more scrutiny and a lot more trust because as soon as you stick something into an llm it's like a blender right it gets mm -hmm. blended up you don't know where anything went you don't know what <laughs> contributed to which kind of answer so if you have no way of figuring out where that information came from and why it's doing what it's doing then you got to big old problem on your hands but let's get into it so so yeah. the benchmark what is the benchmark you all have talked about well it's yeah. you know increasing by this much percentage what is increasing what is what is what is yeah. this thing supposed to be showing us okay so i'll i'll, I'll describe the uh, setup and you can read the details here and i'm like i'm trying to try to yeah keep we'll, it we'll have all the links to everything in the yeah. in the yeah. comments so you can go there, see there it. actually are a lot of details but the basic idea is if only we could find a reasonably complex data schema on some real industry. And it turns out the um, OMG, the Object Management Group, published a schema about the insurance industry, um, I don't know, a few years ago. And by chance, Juan had done a little project with this, whereby he had generated a bunch of um, fake data according to the schema. Now, the schema is a relational schema. This has nothing to do with graph data at all. This is very good old-fashioned object management group, mm -hmm, stodgy, mm -hmm. you know, sorts of stuff. And very much the kind of thing that big database vendors, you know, so the Microsoft and Snowflakes and Oracles and so on of the world, you know, that that's going right into, into their world. And we happen to have this schema, which was public domain, published by the OMG, a bunch of data that Juan had put together, that this is actually a schema of reasonable complexity. Because what we had found was if you used a single table, like over a spreadsheet, the LLMs writing queries over spreadsheets were doing phenomenally. They could answer complicated questions um, and they would get them quickly and accurately. And it was great. The thing is a single spreadsheet can only answer so many questions. You know, the reason why we have database schemas is so that you can have different ways of looking at your data and answer different questions over the same data. And once you got to two or three tables that were interacting, the performance dropped off. Now you ask, what do you mean by performance? So unlike the past, and like you said about LLMs, like these blenders, you can ask the same LLM the same question 10 times and get 10 different answers. Mm -hmm. And I, everybody on this podcast will have experienced this in one way or another. And if you say, I would like to have the LLM give me 10 different, 10, 10 answers to the question in the form of a query, you actually don't typically get 10 different queries. You do get fewer. So you're already doing a little bit better. 
but how many of those queries are right? You can have two queries that look very different, but they're both right. So the question is, how many customers placed their first order in January of 2024? Okay, now there's a question. You could query that by looking at customers, figuring out when their first order was, seeing what that date was compared to January of 2024. The, the same, there's those, many ways to skin a cat, right? <laughs> many ways to skin a cat. And a bunch of those queries will be correct and a bunch of them will be incorrect. Okay, so what do you do? This is what Juan and I did. We took this this uh, data schema. He already had the fake data. Working with some SMEs, he came up with 44 questions against this. I just did one that was in e-commerce because it was at the top of my head. So these mean more things like um, how many uh, policies did we have go for a whole year without any claims? You know, so that would be the sort of question you can ask mm -hmm. against this data. And what Juan did is he actually went to the trouble to sit down and as an experienced query writer mm -hmm. and as somebody who has talked to the SMEs in this industry and knows a bit of his way around it, he wrote queries that got the right answer and said, this is my human being expert's opinion. This mm -hmm. is the right answer to this question. Needless to say, across 44 of those, I would look at them and I actually disagreed with two or three of them. I said, no, Juan, I don't think you've got the right answer here. If this didn't happen, you would you would know that I'm lying, right? Because there's no yeah. way that two human beings looking at 44 questions are going to agree completely on all of them. But we took that as, at face value. You. Then we would ask the LLM, say, 10 times. <clears throat> what, what was the question I asked? How many policies went for a whole year without any claims? And it would give us, say, 10 queries. And we'd run those queries against the data. And this is important. Did we look at the two queries and say, did you get the same query? I actually did do a version where I did that before I had any data. And we actually use the data as being the gold standard. So we go back to the data and ask the question. And we use the reference query and ask the question, compare the answers. And this actually turns out there's been a field called text to SQL for decades. And that has also been their gold mm -hmm, standard. Mm -hmm. you, you get the same answer, not mm -hmm. the other queries algebraically the same. And is that how you're getting to the accuracy piece of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's how you get the accuracy. So if I get 10 queries, I now run those 10 queries, compare them to the 10 correct answers. How many did I get right? And did I get one right? That's a 10%. Did I get six right? That's a 60%. Mm -hmm. Did I get all right? That's 100%. Well, and so the reason one key piece I don't want to move from um, yeah. without highlighting, which is there was human in the loop in what you just mentioned, you know, in the setup, <laughs> which is important. Is the human in the loop is in the setup. You can run the experiment a thousand times without any more human intervention, but to set it up, you need a human exactly. in the loop. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's a very important point that you're actually measuring against a human being's judgment. And it is a judgment. I want to emphasize that it's mm -hmm, a judgment. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, Juan and I disagreed about a handful of them. And in one of our customers, we set up a similar experiment to, to, uh, to basically deploy this. We wound up spending three months because their questions were quite involved. Mm -hmm. And when you look at these questions, guess what? Their expert query writers wrote queries that... I think I can say are just objectively wrong. If you ask about the month of April, I mean, that's humanity, I right? Like that's why yeah. there yeah. are benchmarks and consistency, right? We, we say that's this right. all the time in the ML and AI space, which is yeah. the 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 AI is way more consistent. I mean, LLMs, mm, <laughs> LLMs have changed uh, that a bit. Yeah, <laughs> this has changed a little bit. But but if you have that that core foundation of what you are deeming accurate and you've done yeah. your benchmarks on that yeah then you can at least measure what the LLM is doing against that's it right but they're going to yeah. be consistent in their logic patterns because it's it's math mm -hmm. right it's yeah, math yeah. That's right. and there's a lot of complicated math with llms but it's still math yeah. um but humans i mean you got a bad day you write it a wrong way maybe you yeah. forget some stuff in that syntax somewhere like that's just humanity are, are you you pick up the phone to ask the data analyst what's how do we interpret the notion of first order and they're on vacation and so you make oh, something yeah. up yeah. yeah yeah all sorts of human things can get into this so that that was it. i mean th th there's i think we need to to dive a little bit deeper into you know how that works. I mean, how does an LLM generate a question, uh, mm -hmm. a, a query, a structured query in SQL in this case, or in Cypher mm -hmm. or whatever language? So, and and, and it's kind of a, a basically, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dean. But the idea is, you know, you you ask a question in natural language, the and at, at the same time you pass some some description of what the schema is, mm -hmm. so that then the LLM can do the mapping and say, well, when you say a customer, that's probably 
table called customer. There's a direct match. Mm-hmm. And and because it's trained on, on, on lots of public resources on SQL, understand the mm-hmm. syntax, you know, it will generate something that's plausible and sometimes correct. Right. So so the, the, there's there's this idea of of passing the, the description of what your data looks like. Because the, the the at the bottom of this we're we're we have relational data that are uh, that's described in in you know with the DDL. That's so that's all the information we have. But we know the process, right? So uh, some expert probably described uh, the domain in an entity relationship model, or even in an ontology. If, if uh, but but in some kind of uh, a high level conceptual uh, model, and then that got translated into tables and, and and implemented in a relational database. And the thing is as many times happens, all the first thought was lost. And what we have now is a relational database. And all we know is table names, column names, mm-hmm. morning keys that have an ID that's a number. So we have a very limited description of this model to pass to the LLM, mm-hmm. right? So, and here's where probably uh, uh, Dean was going to explain, you know, let's put a, 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 let's put back, it's a kind of a corrective action. Let's put yeah. back this description that was lost in the way. And that mm-hmm. is, I would say the case in 70, 80, 90% of the cases in, 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 in enterprise, right? So someone build that, maybe it's documented in, in but it's mm-hmm. not really usable programmatically. So let's yeah. put that layer on top and that take the form of an ontology plus mm-hmm. a mapping, right? That's that's where, so this is the the, the kind of detailed technical setup and that's, and, yeah. and then, I mean, to me, uh, I, I wanted to to compare that to to an equivalent setup in 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 Neo 4 J, where we would not have the data in a relational uh, database, but mm-hmm. we would move the data, applying the same mapping mm-hmm. into a graph database mm-hmm. that would be described in the terms of the of this mm-hmm. kind of high level conceptual model. So we kind of built into our data this layer that's otherwise yeah. built on top of your relational data, and mm-hmm. we understand you know. The, the pros and cons of, of, of the, each each approach. So so that's what I what I did. And 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 one of the great things is of course uh, well first of all we talked at the beginning we share our code and they share all the details all the assets for their experiment, and uh, and well in particular the definition of the of the ontology was using one of the W three C standards. I think it was in OWL or RDFS. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. And and well. We happen to have, uh, you know, tooling to 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 import that to to generate assets in Neo4j, mm-hmm. and, and that's one of the. I think it's worth, Ooh, worth one uh, thing and, because that I think okay. is a very hotly de- debated topic, not amongst the two of you, but in general. Did you just say you use an ontology in Neo4j? How is that possible? <laughs> just, well, just okay. humor us. <laughs> Of course, you know, and, and and if I was given a pound every time someone asks that question, I probably would be replied. Right <laughs> I know, now. But, I know. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, true, exactly. So and 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 that that's one thing because I I have to say that still, and 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 I would like to hear your 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 side of of uh, both of you actually, yeah, because. Yes, I, I happen to have, like I said at the beginning, a background in the semantic stack, and I can I can look at an ontology, and I can look at the at the mapping language that that you guys were using, and I could make use of it. Mm-hmm. While it's public, open source is following open standards. What's the pers- the portion of the of the graph community that could do? I mean, it's it's doable, True. but how complex it is? How, how many of us are in a position to 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 bridge that gap between the two? So that that's oh, that's true. still still very much. Because yes, it's it's yeah. it, the technologies that I see as complementary, but still I don't see uh, 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 you're on one side or the other. That's a sad reality. Yeah. And, and that's what, and, what and I'm not going to open the can of worms. I will just throw the, the grenade right in and, and walk away from it. <laughs> it's another conversation for another day. I mean, I have many thoughts on that, but one of my major ones, and I think because of all of the stuff that we're talking about here, where you can now talk to your data, you can talk to your graph. You don't necessarily need to learn Cypher or GQL or, or Sparkle, Sparkle or whatever, all the, all the or, other ones. Or right, SQL that for that matter. Yeah, you still need to know enough to like troubleshoot it because it's not always going to be right. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not like, yeah, don't learn anything. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I am saying is you don't have to become an expert. The the entry, uh, the barrier to entry is is much lower because the LLMs can actually help you do that. And you'll learn along the way when you're doing it. But um, the the main thing I would say up until this point was Sparkle is not the best thing to learn, meaning it's not fun to learn. It's, it's kind of gnarly if you're not used to that. And I know 
this is not me speaking because I, I actually learned Sparkle first. <laughs> so no. this is not me speaking. This is every single engineer I have ever worked with was like, oh, what is this thing? Can I just use like that? I heard this, the cipher thing is way more like SQL. No. So like that's that I will say like before LLMs are were introduced, now we have more options. Mm -hmm. um, but that was one of the major reasons that people didn't learn the other side of the coin. I, from what I totally I've heard. agree on that, and 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 I I'm, I'm like you. I mean, I I learned Sparkle first. I I was first on on the on the RDF side, and actually when I when I learned Cipher when I joined Neo, it was it was kind of strange to me. But uh, but I think you know it's not just the query language; it's it's the level of abstraction, and that's mm -hmm. that's my that's my my way of thinking. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think of of the property graph, and I don't want to take that conversation there, but yeah. Uh, it's like you know thinking in terms of i mean our building blocks blocks in the property graphs is nodes and relationships a node is a is a is a rich object with internal structure with a collection of properties mm -hmm. and and same relationships and these are the traditional objects in object oriented programming and mm -hmm. that's people that's something that people is i mean developers data people are familiar with it, yep. with this structure now take that and decompose it in individuals every property now becomes a triple every relationship yep. is a triple. So yes, exactly the same information, but you're working at a different level of abstraction. Yeah. And that's yeah. where I think people kind of say, hey, I, I, I can do that. But and I, I actually have a slide that I use a lot from a professor in, I think it's the University of Oslo, who was talking about that. Mm -hmm. And he was taking a Python Hello World, and mm -hmm. then he was showing the assembly mm. equivalent of that. And he's mm -hmm. like, you know, this is high up. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable here. This is exactly the same thing, but that's not the kind of thing I want to type. I mean, yeah. it, it's great. It, it, it will be great maybe for, for exchange. It will be good. So that, that's, that's, and again, that, I think that's one of the reasons why we see, and, and again, I learned first uh, RDF. I, I learned first Sparkle. I, I, I'm pretty fluent and, 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 and confident yeah. in that space, but I, I believe that's, that's still yeah. one, one sort of a blocker in, in people's. Oh. But the thing is that this discussion actually is way, way older than Sparkle yeah. and RDF. Oh, very much so. so. Yeah. I recall back in the 90s talking to some friends of mine uh, at the university in Europe saying, um, we need to change how we teach computer science. We always teach people programming languages like whatever was the thing in the day, which um, would have been maybe Pascal or PL1 mm -hmm. or Fortran or something like that. I can't remember now what it was. They said, um, this is a really bad idea. We need to start people out on Prologue. Mm. And Prolog and Sparkle are really similar. You describe mm. your, your solution, and then magic happens. And actually, I, I will take uh, some issue with Jesus's comparison. The, the assembly code is SQL. So when I say SQL, here's a table about playwrights. Here's a table about plays. How do I say Shakespeare wrote Hamlet? Shakespeare wrote Hamlet by saying Shakespeare is playwright number one. Hamlet is play number 17. And then there's a table that says one connects to 17. And I call that thing rights. That's right. That looks like assembly code to me. I actually, I'm old enough, Jesus, that my second computer science course was, of course, of course, take the programming language you're working in and write the disassembler for it. You know, this this yeah. is what we did. That was the way we were taught computer science. That talk you just gave, it's like, wait a minute, computer science 102 back in the mm, 80s. Um, yeah. Absolutely, you know, but, but, uh, but to your point, I, I, but let, I let me still... Let me finish. Let me finish one go, thing. Go, go ahead. What does, what does Shakespeare wrote Hamlet look like in RDF? Well, but that's, that's I just important. said it. It looks it's Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. What does it look For, like in Neo? Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. These are the high level things. S sure. SQL is the assembly code. Yeah, kind of. I mean, the, 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 I, I don't the think kind of. I think really. I mean, the, the analogy. I, 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 All I right. Don't... Well, let's hear what Jesus has to <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. What I was going to say is that is that in SQL, there's the no. I mean, there's the notion of a table. I mean, so yeah. it's not like Hamlet is probably a record in in a table in a that table. has a collection yeah. of properties. So Hamlet yeah. has a name. Hamlet has a date of birth. Hamlet has you know X, Y, and, and Z. Hamlet has a primary key. And has a primary key, absolutely. Yeah. But then, but then, go and take, you know, decompose that and put mm -hmm. it in a in a single universal three column table. Well, you have yeah. all the statements, and then yeah. this record that used to be Hamlet now becomes primary key property Hamlet one mm -hmm. entry, mm -hmm. primary key mm -hmm. second prop date of birth yeah. for Hamlet, and and so it's like. Yes, well, you can implement it in relational, but you're kind of taking it, yeah. and and we can go on forever. Yeah, yeah. but you, well, you see, I wanted to say one so, thing. How do you write the query? Who wrote Hamlet in Sparkle? 
I just well, did it. Who wrote Hamlet? That's a query. How do you write in cipher? Who wrote Hamlet? Sure. These are the high level languages. When you say foreign key, where foreign key in yeah. this thing equals primary key in that thing. True. And actually, this gets to our primary topic here, Ashley. Why did we get a three to one improvement? Yeah. I have a theory. In graphs, and then I'm not going to talk about sparkles, cipher, in graphs. Graphs. Shakespeare in general. wrote Hamlet. Bam. What does that look like in a table? Shakespeare has a primary key. Exactly. Hamlet has a primary key. The primary key for Shakespeare and the primary key for Hamlet are related. I just said three things. The LLM has to keep three things in its head. The representation of Shakespeare, the representation of Hamlet, and the representation of rote. Got three things it has to generate. And what does the query look like? Shakespeare is in this table. Hamlet is in that table. And the primary key of this has to write three things. In a graph language, what does it have to do? One thing, mm -hmm. someone wrote Hamlet or Shakespeare wrote something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I were to have been, had to guess, how much more work does the LLM have to do with the two tables and the joined table, mm -hmm, table mm -hmm. versus the single, I'll use a triple in the semantic world, but the same is true in any graph representation, a single relationship. Yeah. It's actually, well, what a surprise. It's a shortcut. It's, three it's to one. Giving, and the shortcut cool. is exactly a three to one shortcut. Well, and that's how you decrease yeah. those hallucinations too, right? So the, the yeah. first scenario you were describing, there's all whole bunch of stuff that can distract that LLM and it can go off the rails. And we've or all seen LLMs being distracted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's more it's more than a shortcut. It's it's like naming, I mean making yeah. explicit something that otherwise is called there's something between table one and table two that's called right. FK FK25. Well that that's a very good be, point, Jesus. Yeah. Be the yeah. author, be the author of. And by making yeah. relationships first class citizens, mm -hmm. we're adding, you know, a lot of semantic, a lot of meaning to our data. Yeah. And that's exactly Absolutely. what you guys did. So so mm -hmm. what, what I saw and, and is like, of course, they're gonna get much better results because they are yeah. bringing back this information that, that was context is there. So so the, of course, now, yeah. one of my blogs was, it's obvious, but is it true? You know, Jesus just said, of course. And I said, of course, too, at that same spot. But that's why we do science. But, things that are obvious oh, are not no, no, not just that it. but that the, the folks that don't do graph that's yeah. not of course to that that's not obvious right yeah. exactly absolutely yeah. no yeah. and don't get me wrong i mean saying of course is one thing and proving it with the benchmark is <laughs> another thing yeah. and that's that's yeah. the yeah. value so and, and this so, is where jesus and i are are aligned 100 percent because totally. you know, we, we understand and, that yeah that other people but, are but I, you know and, and my intention there was okay we have this this Domain, I mean, this this more conceptual level description of, of, of the content of this relational database and in the form of an ontology, and mm -hmm. they formalize how this conceptual description mm -hmm. maps yeah. to the underlying data. So can I, you know, because our approach would be different, would be we would suppress this layer on top because we can build that into our data. Now yeah. the price you have to pay is that you have to ETL your data out and, yeah. and persist it somewhere else. Now yeah. Yeah. That's that's exactly what I did. So I, I took their ontology, which was the target model. Mm -hmm. So that's what the data model, the graph model is going to look like. And, and that was uh, uh, kind of automatically built into an ETL, ETL pipeline. And basically the logic that you built into the mappings was the ETL that would transform mm -hmm. your relational mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. into, mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. graph data. So yeah. I effectively moved the data from the relational database in the insurance industry into the graph. And now what you have is something that's already, already a self-describing data. So you have exactly. the semantics built into your data. So yeah, equivalent I, results. And, and that's I where those to... hallucinations go down too, though, right? Absolutely. Just what you're, no. the, you're not just saying Hamlet and Shakespeare, and there's some kind of relation between them. You're saying specifically, this is how these are, th are related. And so if that LLM is getting a query in on that specific context, not only can you now, because you're using like RAG or Graph RAG or one of those other things with, with all of this, if you're using with LLMs, you're then picking up that persistent view of, of facts and, and statements about those entities. But now you know exactly how they relate to each other. And that helps the LLM with its context. Therefore, it's not going to have as many hallucinations. Yeah. Dean, go. <laughs> yeah. So well, one of the topics I wanted to talk about with Jesus is one that he was just now touching on. This is the ETL versus virtualization. Mm -hmm. And this came up in the um, video as well. And I don't know if this is going to be so much a disagreement as in a, a different difference in situation in the world. So <clears throat> where I've always been in my semantic career, yes, I would just love to have an RDF some, store somewhere or any graph store for that matter that's got all the data in it and do graph queries over it. But 
every client I've had in my consulting life, every customer I've had when I've worked for product companies that have done graph uh, data in any form at all, every client, customer, prospect, bar none, bar none, I've never known anything different, have said, of course my data is and will remain in a relational database. And most of them will say, and furthermore, for regulatory policy and heaven knows what other reasons, <laughs> it's going to stay that way. This is not negotiable. And for you don't that have reason, to put everything into a graph, right? Like, I think that's one of my pet peeves is, and it's not you all, it's it's a lot of what we say, unfortunately, kind of maybe comes off as, okay, boil the ocean. I know that's a mm -hmm. fun saying too. Don't boil the ocean. You don't have to have everything in your graph, but yeah. continue, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but if you want to ask, the question like which like the ones I was talking about before, which policies have gone without a claim for a whole year? That data is going to have to be somewhere. This policy had this claim or didn't have this claim, and this claim was on this date. That stuff's going to have to be in the graph, and that's exactly the stuff that they forbid to go into the graph. Mm -hmm. And so, while in my youth I loved the idea of change the world to a graph data world, I think that'd be a wonderful thing. I think the world would be a better place <laughs> if we'd done that back in the '90s, but you know, we didn't and we couldn't. But the 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 sort of harsh reality is I've got to live in a relational world and ETL is basically not an option. Now I hear Jesus say, yeah, I'm going to ETL this in. On the one hand, I'm, I'm not going to be disagreeable. I'm going to be envious, right? <laughs> it's going to be, wait a minute, how on earth do you get yourself in a situation where you actually can well, do that as no. a realistic thing? And this is not a universal solution, and that's why these are. Mm. I mean, there's there's a whole industry of of you know software products that that, that do data federation and 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 yeah. quer querying on demand based on query translations. And there's products that that store data, yeah. and, and then there's there's a whole NoSQL space where where the Mongos of the world with you know the Elastic. Or, there's there's or so Mark many. Or MarkLogic for that matter. Or Mark, yeah. Mark Logic, you know, so many. And 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 uh, so yes, I'm, I'm not saying that every time you systematically yeah. will have to move your data into into Neo 4 j or a graph database, but there will be you know that would be the approach. I mean, that would be the the natural way of replicating the exercise if you were to go. Yeah. Does that apply to your case? Well, and here's the other thing, uh, right, on this, because it's how do you define accuracy? Well, there's accuracy to the queries and the data and other things that you've been talking about. What does that do for an LLM? It makes it more reliable. It makes mm -hmm. it have less hallucinations, right? So tying it back to like, why does this all matter? It's because yeah. you want to have a more yeah. accurate LLM experience potentially. But and I'm curious what you all would say to this. There's also the constraints factor, right? Where, okay, you have a table, but again, because in the past, you kind of fudge some things as long as you got like sort of the right things um, and you had to do a ton of different joints to get it, as long as you got the right answer at the end of the day, it was all fine. Huh. Nowadays, if you have like the wrong data, like this is to what you were saying, you picked up the data and you put it into graph. Well, what if there were some things in there like, I don't know, somebody fat fingered, you know, um, the height of a person is instead of seven feet tall, that's a very tall person. It's 78 feet tall for some reason. Or, or it, seven meters. or <laughs> Right. Or, or something like that. Those constraints that are part of the graph world helps you get all of that figured out before it goes out to the LLM, right? So how does that play into what you all were talking about in your well, actually, various materials? An anecdote I like to tell about this, Ashley, from a large bank I work for, I will not name this bank, and I've worked for enough that they can all point fingers at each other. But um, we were looking at a table for um, corporate relationships. You know, this company owns that company. This company has a controlling stake in that company. And we are trying to model this in a graph. And I'm not going to, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about ontologies or not, but it's just a graph. Yes. And we looked at the original table and we said, I don't see any way in the relational table that they're doing here to tell whether um, Meta owns Facebook or Facebook owns Meta. Mm -hmm. The relationship direction is not mentioned anywhere in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And so we went to our data analyst, Smee, and we asked her about this. And she said, oh, everyone knows that if you ask that database these questions, that you're going to get the answer backwards half the time. Everyone knows. Oh now, no! And, and the Except and the for that one that poor soul that doesn't, and then they use yeah. the data. Well, and the reason I'm telling you the story, Ashley, you said as long as you get the right answer at the end. No, actually, this bank had been working on the wrong answer yeah. for an awful long time, and basically, 
they sort of formed their own reality where ownership was a bi-directional street. And I, I see this all the time. I'll see these queries that um, this query is wrong. And like, well, the business is running on that query. And then the business is making decisions based on false intelligence. Yeah. Well, they limp along anyway. So all I'm only doing is challenging your comment is as long as you got the right answer at the end. No, even if you didn't get the right answer at the but end. But I think that's the, the key though, right from whose perspective? Yeah. Because right? yeah. that's always part of this problem. The business is going to adapt no matter what because mm. the business is facing an organic entity, right? And it's going to find its way forward, um, even if it's getting bad bad intelligence. So anyway, with, with that in mind, that you know, a lot of these queries are actually getting wrong answers, and people yeah. are moving forward with wrong answers today. Yeah. And the LLM, all the LLMs in some sense have done is to pull back the curtain. That's really well, all they've this done. Is what you did, right? Did you encounter yeah. any of this when you were doing the work well, that you did? No, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, if you think of it, how how hard would it be to enforce this kind of enforce this kind of constraint in a federated approach? Mm. I mean, that's that's a reason in favor. I mean, and again, I'm, I'm. But if you want to enforce that somehow, mm. you know, you have more chances of being able to do that if you have the decentralized in a single repository. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that that's you know, in, in a way, you're yeah, you adding flexibility, but you're you're losing control, right? And and, and yeah. that's another interesting point where I wanted to go. So so yeah, I, I love this idea of being able to define declaratively how to get and we can get into the detail. What was it? It was the policyholder uh yeah. the concept that, that you analyze in particular that I picked because it's one of those that that yeah, there's in in our in our entity relationship model. Maybe there was the notion of a policyholder, which was yeah. an entity in itself. Mm. But after you know translation into table into into, into tables, the, the, the implementation uh, model, and even some general. I mean, whatever the process is that takes you to the database that we're having today. Well, a policyholder ended up being the subset of the records in the table. Right, a field. Party. Yeah, that, that contain a particular value for a particular column. That's the kind of thing that, and you know, uh, obviously an LLM will never be aware of unless you yeah. surface that in yeah. the form of a. Of so, a you have so, to be explicit. And so, uh, so, so this is this is great because you know not only you know when you surface it, you have it accessible for any consumer, but mm -hmm. at the same time, how hard is to implement these kind of on-the-fly translations for a federated approach that also will mm -hmm. limit the mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, the kind of use cases that these can support. I mean, will this? Yeah. Uh, what, what's the expected SLA from you know from a, 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 an application that's based on the idea of query translation? So again, there's not never going to be a universal answer. This is the right yeah. way. We've, um, we've been kind of skirting around some things on why one approach has maybe got some different perks than the other. Um, doesn't mean one side is better than the other. Mm -hmm. But but let's let's get into that. What what are the pros and the cons between these two approaches that you have all taken? I'm going to start with you, Jesus, since I started with Dean the last time. Yeah. Well, you know, a, a centralized approach gives you gives you full control, right? So we're seeing how how that you know think of the big companies that are now being super successful in terms of you know in the in the analytics space, the, the snowflakes, the data mm -hmm. What did it? You, you would dump all your data in, in you know as it comes from operational systems, and then you use dbt or whatever to create your and 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 you you're constantly replicating and that's what you know makes yeah. both snowflake and, and aws super successful because you know you're uh, so it's not the perfect approach but it's the it's the one that 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 works i mean that that's that's one that's one way so and then the reason is because you just mentioned it i want to impose some constraints i want to find some metrics i want to you can do that here mm. the other way good luck i mean you will be able to cover yeah. some cases now is it more I don't know. I mean, give me give me a, an, an an argument in the other in the other direction, right? Why okay. would I not move my data into Snowflake and, and just have a federated well, approach uh, and well, it on the fly? Well, so. well, yeah. Well, Snowflake, <clears throat> of course, isn't actually a, a single database. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think of Snowflake as being a federation platform. I mean, you, you. I mean, Dean, you said that it's it's not possible to centralize all the data. You're absolutely right. And at the same time, in the same yeah. way, it's not possible to federate all the data. I mean, when right. I hear this, this kind of enterprise-wide uh, data federation, you know, yeah, good luck with that. It's like a, you know, yeah. 
and, and of course we have to separate the two i mean the technical implementation from the you know you you just yeah. you're talking about aligning with fiber as an enterprise you know vocabulary canonical used set of terms that, that's yeah. that's great that, that's you know yeah. and, and, and that's that's one yeah. thing now how do you do you use that to etl your data into a centralized database or you use it to to federate and you know you i could. happen to work between you know between my rdf days and and uh, yeah. and um and the neo4j days for a company that did precisely that, the data they focus on data federation. The name it's called the Nodo, yeah. and 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 they, they oh, didn't yeah. look at it as a graph. They they look at it as relational sure. data. They they create like a a virtual federated mm -hmm. relational model. But now yeah. you know, even if you have agreed on what's the target model, you have to build into all the mappings. You have to build into yeah. access control. You yeah. have to, yeah. and then from a technical point of view, things like you know what kind of workloads and what can you expect in terms mm -hmm. of performance when you query something that has to go through twenty five transformations before you get hitting the 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 the, the, the source systems. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you have to cache data. So it's it's a very complex problem, and and mm -hmm. and. I, Again, uh, that can work at the departmental level. I don't know if it's even thinkable, you know, to have mm. a large enterprise. You know, that, that sounds like a, a a great idea, but uh, but the reality is, it's going to be somewhere in between. Yeah. And well, it's going to be a, it's going to be a hybrid. Approach. You're going to have sometimes you're going to pick a, a persisted approach, and that's yeah. what I think. Uh, 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 you know, my my idea of of taking your your benchmark and and uh, yeah. and analyzing it from the Neo4j perspective, it's more like you know. Trying to explain, hey, these are the two approaches, and that's what that would look like. Well, no, certainly for something on that scale, you know, if you were to meet something like that in the uh, you know in a real enterprise world, yeah, that's yeah. thing you absolutely can materialize and query over. And why on earth would you not, right? So <laughs> it's it's <laughs> all back to well, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that that you've both made some good arguments to why your stance is, is maybe one one way or the other. And it sounds like there's actually a whole lot of overlap anyways on, right. on your opinions on it. Well, but what are some of the other, other pros and cons that come along for the ride with this? Well, well one depends on what, what you're talking about this being. So one of the things that uh, we, we talked about- The research about, you did. <laughs> yeah, well, in the field, talking about, so talking about that specific, there's a lot of aspects to it. One of the things that I found very interesting uh, with you know, having a, an explicit ontology for um, for the benchmark, so the there's a cost to be made, be paid. You have to actually build that ontology and map it to your data, which we've alluded to in the last 10 minutes here. But one of the interesting um, uh, capabilities you get from that, and we see this all the time, the LLMs, I think the LLM spent too much time with that data manager that I knew at the big bank uh, that uh, they have seen an awful lot of places where you can't tell whether Meta owns Facebook or Facebook owns Meta. And they get really confused about this, way more so than you would actually expect, given that the ontology said very clearly what which way these things go. So the example I like to give in the, in the insurance one is do brokers sell policies or do policies sell brokers? Right now, if anybody who speaks English and sort of understands those sentences will say, well, brokers sell policies. That's what brokers do. Policies aren't humans. They can't sell things. You know, it goes that way. Nevertheless, on a rather large number of the failures, of course, Juan and I have, have examined the failures um, in our benchmark runs. A very common error is that it'll get these things backwards. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of surprising, but you know, the, 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 we, we never know what's going to be surprising or what's going to be obvious in the world of LLMs. But one of the neat things is that if you go to the ontology, it actually says, well, cells has as its domain people and brokers are people and has as its range uh, products and policies are products. So you can actually look at the ontology, look at this query, and with no LLM in the world at all, in fact, with nothing in the world at all, this is just ordinary RDFS inferencing. This has been around for 25 mm -hmm. years. Just look at this and say, um, as Willy Wonka would say, strike that, reverse it. <laughs> and so... One afternoon, in about an hour, I was able to implement that. And turns out it works, first of all, lickety split. When you're used to LLMs taking you know, 10 to 30 mm -hmm, seconds to do mm -hmm. stuff, you do something like this that actually is loading two very small metadata sets, running a very small comparison over them, and then reporting on it. It actually can go through dozens of these things literally in the blink of an eye. And yeah. then if you take that thing back and you tell the LLM, you know, you say, hey, I'm Willy Wonka, strike that, reverse it. The LLMs are actually really good at striking that and reversing it. And suddenly... But it'll take longer. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it'll take, but it will take longer. Indeed, you get a a jump up in your performance, and so this is one of the things uh, about having an explicit ontology that gives us a lot of this control over not the data, 
but over the query. Yeah, I totally agree on that. I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, we see that a lot, but but also I think we're, um, and it's natural because that's the way we, we've got there, but it, mm. we're still approaching these exercises a one shot. And it's and, mm. and the reality is not, it's not that anymore. I mean, what yeah. we're seeing in the field is that, yes, you would be very lucky if even injecting the ontology, and that's something that we're seeing also on the Neo side. I mean, we we have, you, you can you can query the ontology to the, of the NeoPJ graph and you have, you know, in a different form, you have the, the, the direction of the relationships. But even even with that, even injecting the ontology in the process, it's never going to be, I mean, you might be lucky in some cases and that's what you're getting. But but the reality these days is that it's more is what they, they're calling it and sort of an agentic approach. I mean, you will try a query, you might fail, you will analyze the quality of the results, you mm. will retry, you would combine it maybe with a vector based search. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will it will become a much more complex process because yeah. you know yeah. it, it's uh, it's it's uh yeah that, that that's that's what we're seeing and and uh, and in a way I think uh, I think well it's it's a much richer it's becoming like a software software problem software software design problem rather yeah. than a, your, yeah, you know, query and translation. I think anyone who doesn't answer that question, something like the way that Jesus just did, isn't paying attention, honestly. Yeah, to think yeah. that you can get everything in one shot, um, that just or they're just you know, sense. tunnel vision it could be that, you know, yeah, okay, but yeah, all right, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs>